Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings that I've heard about, together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realize that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, people gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me... Have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B-R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time... They have denied all knowledge of any such find, and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim, believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a higher altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now, the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn, but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. Okay. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. 
If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips, what about alien abduction? Uh, well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, Birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies, and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe, from the North Pole to the South. 
The Arctic Tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometers each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio program about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, listeners. Today, I'd like to welcome Edward Fox, who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you, Eunice. For most people, at least, buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person? who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work. All for shopping. Without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet, houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices you may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area? Or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children, or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses which, incidentally, are the most common. And for good reason, because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings, things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs, are all in good working order because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order may be a very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When then University of Wisconsin-Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s, much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. Instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's arboretum committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted in the Arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities. In focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscape, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced 
a whole new concept in ecology, ecological restoration. The process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous, usually more natural, condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognized the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the Arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the Depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, Crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the Arboretum and provided most of the labor needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the Arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the Arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest, but also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the Arboretum, like most Arboreta, has traditional collections of labelled plants arranged in garden-like displays. These horticultural collections, featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.